let's pray before we get started and let's get into it. Father, we uh, thank you again for your word. Thank you uh, for uh, a whole book, Lord, that is uh, just a setup for what's going to be taking place during the end times. And Lord, as we're going through and talking about two faithful guys that um, stand up against unrighteousness in the most unrighteous time that the world's ever going to see, Lord, we just pray that uh, you would speak to us from it, speak to us from, from their example, and uh, Lord, help us just to be uh, people who follow you with a full heart. Thank you, Jesus, uh, for the work that you do in us, and we just give you this time again tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's uh, just start from the, from the beginning just for context. It says, verse 1, Then I uh, was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it's been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I'll give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now after the three and a half days... The breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them, and they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. And so you have these two guys that are going to show up in the in the city of Jerusalem. A um, couple, couple of precursors here. The temple is built, and so we talked about the fact that the temple needed to be rebuilt for this uh, prophecy to come to pass. Also, the temple needs to be rebuilt for the uh, prophecies that we see in Revelation 13 come to pass. Um, one of the things that has to take place during the tribulation period, according to Jesus in Matthew 24, is what's called the abomination of desolation. And that's where the temple is defiled and um, the, uh, the sacrifice and offering stops in the temple in Jerusalem. This verse, uh, uh, Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, was written after the temple has already been destroyed. Revelation was written in the 90s. Nobody believes that it was written before 70 AD. So the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, and so that verse, verse 1 there, is a prophecy about the rebuilding of the Jewish temple, okay? And in that prophecy, it talks about the fact that the temple is measured itself, and the people are measured. So it's not just the temple, it's the people. When you got God measuring the temple, you have this same kind of language that's used in the book of Ezekiel, and it's the idea of going through and taking stock, of what's happening in the temple. And in the book, in a book of Ezekiel, uh, the, there's a measurement of the temple, and then God begins revealing to Ezekiel what's taking place inside the, the Jerusalem temple. At the very least, what's taking place in the hearts of the priests. And so there's all this defiling stuff that's taking place in the temple. You know, um, same thing would happen with a, with a church. If God took out a measuring rod and began to measure Calvary Chapel, the idea behind that is he's looking at what's happening at Calvary Chapel. He's seeing all the ins and outs. He's measuring everything that's happening here. And um, it's the, uh, it, it carries the, the connotation of judgment. It's the idea he's, come, he's checking things out. And he's about to come and judge. And that's what we have in the book of Revelation. It also says that he's measuring the people. He measures the people who are in the temple. Same thing. Same deal. 
You measure the temple, it's a, it's a picture of there's, there's problems here and we're gonna come in and we're going to be dealing with the problems. You measure the people, it's exactly the same thing. There's pro, there are problems here and we're gonna come in and we're gonna measure these people. Who would be the, t the people that would be going to the Jerusalem temple? Who are they? Yeah, they're Jews, they're Jews. And one of the things that, that the book of Revelation is clear about is that God's gonna be dealing with the Jewish people and he's going to bring them back into a relationship with him. Not only the book of Revelation, but also the, the minor prophets and the major prophets all prophesy about the fact that in the last days, the Jewish nation is going to be turned around and they're gonna come back into a relationship with Jesus. Last couple of chapters of Zechariah are great on this. And so you go from basically like Zechariah chapter 10 all the way to the end of the book. And um, there's, there's all kinds of uh, places where it talks about this, this restoration of the relationship of the people of Israel to Jesus. It talks about Gentiles um, treading the temple underfoot for 42 months. Those 42 months, are that's, that's three and a half years. And so you can do the math, just divide 42 by 12, right? And so that's three and a half years. And it's the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. It looks like at the beginning of the tribulation, the temple's rebuilt. And it looks like the Antichrist has something to do with that. And so the first, first three and a half years, everything's cool in the temple as far as the world and the Jews and, and temple worship and all that kind of stuff. And it's at the end of the three and a half year point, the middle point of the tribulation, that the, that the Antichrist comes in and he performs that thing, the, the abomination of desolation. What the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2 is that he walks into the Jerusalem temple, he goes into the Holy of Holies. Who, who is the only guy that's allowed in the Holy of Holies? That's the high priest. And what tribe does he come from? Yeah, the tribe of Levi. What, what family in the tribe of Levi? Aaron's family, right. So you have to be of Aaron's family from the tribe of Levi. You have to be the high priest. Nobody else goes into the Holy of Holies. And so uh, the Antichrist um, himself goes in, and if he's pretending to be the Messiah, and he is Jewish, they don't know these things for sure, but it looks like it, it may be. I'll, I'll get, you, get you in a second. Um, if, if that's the case, then what you would have is a guy from the tribe of Judah walking into the temple. That's why Jesus never walked into the temple itself. He Jesus would never go into the Holy of Holies. Jesus made up the rules. And so he would never go into the Holy of Holies himself. So, yeah, Steve. Do they know, uh, do they have the name Pastor Aaron? Is that the name of Jesus? Right. Yeah. Um, the question uh, for the tape is, uh, do they know the lineage back to the family of Aaron? Um, no, they don't, except for this. Uh, when, when uh, you, know, you know about Jewish last names? So if they have the last name uh, Levi, most likely they're from tri the tribe of Levi. Levi, Levit, all those types of names from the tribe of Levi. And then you have the, the Jewish name Cohen, and the, word, and the word Cohen itself means priest. And so if you are uh, from the, uh, you have the last name Cohen, there's a good chance that you have a, uh, that you have a lineage back to Aaron's line. Then on top of it, there is a, there's a genetic marker for the priesthood. The Jews have figured out there's a genetic marker. And so um, probably what they would be doing is looking at last names, looking at lineage like that. They don't have a definite, uh, you know, absolutely for sure type of lineage uh, because all the genealogies were burnt, burnt up with the temple in 70 AD. So they don't have anything definite there, but that's how they would be going back and looking at that. And so they're already doing this. They've got, they've got uh, um, actually for, for a few years now, uh, they've, ha they've had priests that are doing sacrifices in Israel. And the sacrifices usually have to do with the Passover. Those are the ones that, that I've seen uh, in, in, the, uh, in the media. And so they're sacrificing Passover lambs on the day of Passover. And the guys who are doing it are dressed up as priests, and they're from from you know they're from from the priestly tribe as far as they can tell. That's what that's what these guys are doing. So it's already in the works. So you you have that going on, and that again, Jesus said that at the midpoint, three and a half years in, that's when the abomination of desolation takes place, 
And then Jesus tells the Jewish people, you need to get out of Dodge. When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the temple, and Jesus said, whoever reads, you need to understand this. You need to flee the city of Jerusalem. You better hope it's not in winter. You better hope there's no snow. You better hope there's no pregnant, you know, that you're not pregnant because you, you need to get out quickly. And that's when there's a general persecution, it looks like, of the Jewish people. So then it's trodden underfoot for 42 months. So that's from the, the midpoint of the tribulation to the end point when Jesus comes back. And so, again, you have that. Then he begins talking about the two witnesses, and we've already pretty much covered this. There's, there's a passage in the book of Zechariah. If you look at verse, uh, verse 4 in, um, uh, in the passage, it says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And that's out of, straight out of Zechariah chapter 4. And it's in that passage that God, that God says, it's not by might, not by power, but my, by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Um, and, he, and he talks about the, this mountain will be removed. And it's the idea of, uh, in that passage uh, in Zechariah, he's specifically talking about um, a guy from the kingly line or a guy from the priestly line that God was going to use there. And we've got the, the uh, same thing going on. There's a, there's a prediction that this is going to also take place in the future. And these guys, these two guys that, we, that we've been talking about are going to be fulfilling that. Uh, there are options for who these two guys may be. Um, in, in the Bible, one of them pretty much is not optional, um, and that's Elijah. And so we talked about Elijah and the fact that the Bible says that Elijah's coming before the great and terrible day of the Lord, and he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers back, back to the hearts of the children. He's going to restore uh, family relationships in the land of Israel and, and true worship of God. It's the last verses in the Old Testament. It's the last promise that you have in the Old Testament that, that um, Elijah's coming uh, before this period of time, uh, uh, before the second coming of Christ, what we would call the second coming of Christ. And so you have that. Um, you also have uh, some of the plagues that uh, are connected with them. If you look at, again at verse 5, if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. And so that passage lets you know that this is not a figurative thing. Somebody wants to harm one of these guys, there is fire that comes out and destroys these guys. Um, fire coming from their mouth, I don't know if it literally comes from their mouth or if, it's a, if, that's a, if that's an idiom of they open their mouth, state that these guys need to be destroyed and then, they're, then they're, they're just burned up. But you guys, they're burned up. And so you have that from the, the ministry of Elijah. Uh, you remember Elijah's on the mountain or he's on a hill and they, uh, the king sends out guys to get him. Man of God, the king wants you. Come down. And Elijah goes, if I'm a man of God, then let fire come down out of heaven and destroy you and your 50. And he was, and so it did. You know, and they're gone. And that happened two different times. And then the third time, uh, the guy comes up and goes, man of God, you know, I'm just a messenger. Please don't, don't kill us. The king just wants to see you. And he goes, I'll come with you. And uh, the first two guys apparently were way too cocky in, in that situation. And you literally had fire come down out of heaven and destroy them. This is a rowdy time. That's the point that I'm making to you. And there are times when, when God is just done. He's just done. And there's not going to be any um, back talk. There's not going to be any attitude. And he's just done. And so you better listen up. And obviously this is one of those times. God is a God of grace. He loves people. He gives them lots of chances. But then there comes a point where he's all done. And you see this routinely throughout scripture. And so this is, again, one of those times. So fire comes down out of heaven. It says, again, verse 6, these have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls. That's common to, uh, uh, again, Elijah. Elijah walks into the, the uh, throne room of Ahab and says, Hi there, um, it's not going to rain until I say so, see ya. And he turns around and walks out. And we find out from the New Testament it didn't rain for three and a half years. And, and so you, uh, you, you again have that. Um, it talks about they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. And so the first guy most likely is talking about Elijah. Another option that we talked about is possibly Enoch, 
uh, in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 5, it talks about this guy Enoch, and it says that, that Enoch walked with God, and then it says that he was not because he pleased God, and so God took him. And so Enoch is, a, is an option for that because Elijah, you, you remember when Elijah died? You reading your Bible where Elijah died? That's a trick question. <laughs> Elijah never died. So with Elijah, what happened was he was taken up in a chariot of fire. The guy never dies. So he's just taken straight into heaven. And so you have that. And so a lot of people will, will, will go to Enoch uh, because he's the only other guy in, in the whole Bible who never died. God just took him up into heaven. And so he is a possibility. Um, but, uh, and, and the thinking behind that is they've never died. And so what God's going to do is he's going to bring them back and then it's going to be fulfilled because it's appointed unto man to die once and then after that the judgment, right? So that's normal. Can you think of anybody else who is never going to die? Me. Never going to die if Jesus comes back in my lifetime. We don't die. We're translated. We go straight to heaven. So God's not confined by the dying thing is the point that I'm making. Okay, and so uh, uh, when, when I heard that, it must be Enoch because everybody else has died and, you know, um, and Enoch and Elijah haven't died and so God's got to fulfill his word. You know, it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. Well, everybody who's on the planet when Jesus comes back isn't going to die. And so that's not necessarily what that verse is talking about. And so, but Enoch is an option. Um, but I kind of think it's Moses. And... Um, the death of Moses and the leaving uh, uh, and the ascension of uh, Elijah or the taking up of Elijah are two uh, things that you have that are really weird in the Bible. So Elijah never dies. He goes up in a chariot of fire. Moses, there's a dispute over his body. And so the, the Bible in, um, uh, in the book of Jude talks about the fact that, that Michael, the archangel, and he's, he's a guy that we're going to get into uh, when we get into chapter 12, but Michael the archangel and Satan were having a dispute over the body of Moses. And I don't know what the dispute's about, uh, but you know the, that God took Moses up onto a hill on the other side of the Jordan River and showed him the land of Israel, land of Canaan, and Moses couldn't go in. And then after God showed him the land of Canaan, then Moses died, and it says that the Lord buried him. So he took him and, and he buried him. And uh, one of the things that you have in the New Testament that's interesting is the fact that the Bible says that no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, he's revealed him. And so when you look in the Old Testament, you see all these revelations of God in the Old Testament. What the New Testament says is that's not the Father that's being revealed. It's the Son that's doing the revelation. So when you see God walking in the garden in the, in the cool of the day, that's Jesus. When you have Jesus appearing to the, or when you have God appearing to uh, uh, Abraham, that's Jesus. When you have God appearing to uh, the, the parents of Samson, that's Jesus. And all, all the way through, Jacob also, wrestling with God, that's Jesus. He had a wrestling match with Jesus, right? And so uh, the, the same thing in that instance, when Moses dies and the Lord buries him, that's Jesus taking and doing that. I, I just kind of like that, you know, I don't know. Burials are sad things. And I think, you know, uh, that's, that's where um, many times compassion comes out and sorrow comes out and that kind of thing. My kids, my kids have never seen me cry until one of my dogs die or until I lose a family member. That's when they see me cry. And so, you know, when I think of uh, the Lord burying Moses, I think that that's probably what was going on. The Lord was crying as he put him in the ground. And so it's the only place where Jesus wept uh, it was at a funeral. And so you, you have that. Um, but then there's a dispute over the body of Moses. And the Bible just does not tell us what that dispute is about. And it may have something to do with the fact that God's going to raise him and use him. And so I kind of think that, that the second guy is Moses. It's cool because you would have one guy from the prophets and one guy from the law. And those are the two witnesses that are coming to speak to the people of Israel. And so you want to argue with that? I don't care. Um, you know, whatever. 
Uh, but I, I kind of think that that is probably where it goes. And part of it has to do again with some of the plagues. They have power over waters to turn them to blood. Who turned water to blood? Yeah, it was Moses. And uh, to smite the earth, to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Who is who's identified with plagues in the Bible? Yeah, it's Moses, once again. And uh, it's really interesting that in Matthew chapter 17, at the transfiguration of Jesus, there are two guys talking to Jesus about what's going to happen at the cross. And the two guys are Elijah and Moses. And so there's a, there's a pairing up of these guys uh, in other places in Scripture. You, uh, again, you have that. So Revelation chapter 8 and verse 7 um, you have the first angel uh, sounds and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. Well, that's one of the plagues. That's one of the ten plagues on Egypt. It's the same plague. Okay? Um, when you go to Revelation chapter uh, 16, verses, uh, verse 10, um, it says, And the fifth angel poured out his bull on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. That's one of the 10 plagues. There was a darkness that was so dark in Egypt that it could be felt. A man couldn't see his hand in front of his face. That's one of the plagues that Moses brought. In 1613, it's interesting, it says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And that, again, is a spiritual thing, but who was connected with frogs in the Bible? And again, it's Moses who's connected with frogs. And so you, you have all those hints in Scripture. And again, um, uh, I know for sure that Elijah's coming back because Jesus said so. And so um, Elijah is most likely one of these guys. It may be two other totally different guys. And God could give them all these powers and, and that kind of thing. And Elijah could be doing another thing off on his own. But the Jews are waiting for the coming of Elijah. So uh, when we have done uh, Passover seders, where you, it's the Passover celebration, the Passover meal, at the end of the Passover meal, there is um, on the table, there is a place for Elijah. And so there's a plate that's set for him, and there's a cup uh, with uh, wine mixed with water in it um, set for Elijah. And the very last cup that's drunk uh, before they end the Passover is called the cup of Elijah. And it's at that point that the youngest member of the family gets up and goes to the door to see if Elijah is there. And so a little boy, a little girl gets up and goes to the, goes to the door and opens the door. And you can imagine them. This would be a cool, you know, it would be a cool thing. You know, you're a little kid and you're like, oh, I'm going to go see if Elijah's here. And so you go to the, go to the door and what's, one of the things that, that's cool about it is it's the youngest kid. So every kid gets to do this. Every kid in the family. You're always the youngest at some point. And so every kid gets to do this. And you go to the door, you open the door, you're all excited, and then nobody's there. Turn around and go, he's not here. They close, okay, close the door, honey, come back to the table, and then they, then they uh, pray, and next year in Jerusalem is what they say, right? Well, there's coming a day when a little kid, probably over in Jerusalem, is going to go, he's going to get up from the table, it's the end of the Passover, and he's going to get up from the table, and he's going to go to the door, and he's going to open the door, and the kid's going to turn around to his parents and go, Elijah's here! <laughs> you know? And everybody in the room is going to go, what? What? What is going on? And, and so, again, uh, you, you have that. Jesus made it clear that that was going to take place. If you look at verse 3, he says, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Okay. So, um, because the tribulation period is divided up into 42 months, uh, 1,260 days. Those, those numbers are the same um, throughout the book of Revelation. So it's three and a half years, time, times, and half a time, 42 months, 1,260 days. All the, the, those time periods are all exactly the same thing, which lets you know that what's being used in the book of Revelation and also the book of Daniel is a 360-day uh, year. And a bunch of guys call that the prophetic year, and that's another whole study as far as calendars go, really interesting stuff. But that's how the, 
that's how the the uh, the book or the uh, tribulation period is is divided up. So we think um, seven years. We're thinking 365 and a quarter day years. That is not what it is. It's seven years, 360 day years. So as far as our calendar goes, it's a little bit short of seven years. In any case, first half is 1260, second half is 1260. These guys prophesy for 1260. So it's really natural to take them and go, okay, are they in the first half or in, are they in the second half? And those are the only two options. Is God confined to those two options? No. So he could do half of that on one side, half of that on the other side. He can do anything he wants. He just says that it's 1,260 days. So normally I would just go, okay, maybe they come in the first half of the tribulation or maybe they come in the second half, but that can get problematic. And so if the 1,260 days is in the first half, well, Jesus comes at the end of the second half. And so um, there's some time between the end of the ministry of the uh, two witnesses and the coming of Christ, and you can see that because even if they died right before the second coming of Christ, there's three and a half days that they're, that they're sitting on the ground. You see that down in verse 11? Now, uh, or verse uh, 10, well, excuse me, uh, verse 9. It says, then those from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves, okay? So you got three and a half day period where they're dead. So their, their, their ministry is not going on at that point. I don't know, maybe, they're, maybe he's uh, including that period of time in their ministry. I don't know if he's doing that or not. But in any case, they rise up and it says that there's a, a loud voice from heaven, verse 12, saying to them, come up here, and they ascend to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. And then it talks about the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. In other words, there's another judgment that's coming. And so it might be that they're in the first half of the tribulation. But the, uh, again, um, the reason that they're there is because it's a preparation for the coming of Christ. And so you have them in the first half of the tribulation, the abomination of desolation hasn't even taken place yet. And so from everything else that we know from that period of time, it looks like it's a time when the Antichrist is consolidating his power. He's not actually persecuting people. And so that's what it looks like. And then it's the last half of the tribulation period where the big judgments start happening, including some of the judgments that we're talking about. And so what I'm telling you is there's issues with, with putting them in the first half, okay? If you put them in the second half, um, it's a little bit easier um, because you have all the plagues. And a lot of these plagues are clearly in the second half of the tribulation period. And so the plagues that I told you about, so the darkness on the kingdom of the beast and the, and, uh, the blood and the water and all that stuff, those things are clearly taking place in the second half of the, of the tribulation period. And so it looks like these guys may be involved in that. And so that puts them 1,260 days last half type of thing. But again, there's, there's a separation between their death and their ascension up into heaven um, and the coming of Christ. And so it looks like it's neither. It looks to me like it, start, it starts somewhere right before the, uh, the abomination of desolation. These guys come on the scene. And then um, not too long before the death of Jesus, these guys are taken out, or before the, the, before the coming of Christ, these guys are taken out, and there's a small period of time between their death and the, and the coming of Christ himself. And uh, so you have that. And then again, you have the, the, whole, the, the whole pretext to their ministry is that the Gentiles are trampling, trampling Jerusalem underfoot for 42 months. And so it looks like their ministry takes place during that trampling of Jerusalem which, could, which again would be during the second half. Um, their ministry, again, in, involves torment. Verse 10, it says, And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So all the unbelievers look at everything that these guys are doing and say that that's nothing but torment. And again, if you're getting a plague pulled down on you, that, you know, that would be kind of 
torment. You know, one of the, one of the two witnesses says, mm, you know, we're, we're going to bring blood and, and, and fire mixed with hail, and it's going to burn up a third of the trees and all the green grass because you won't stop. And you know, it happens. And people go, it's your fault. It's torment. You know, that kind of thing. There's no repentance there. Um, again, in Zechariah chapter 4, actually, let's turn over there. Turn over to Ze- Zechariah. It's almost at the end of the, of the um, Old Testament. Go Zechariah, Malachi. Chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. I'll start reading from 1 while you're getting there. It says, Now the angel um, who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who's wakened out of his sleep, and he said to me, What do you see? So I said, I'm looking, and there's a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it, and on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. And so I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. And then he goes on with the, with the rest of the prophecy. And, and I don't want to make it all about Zechariah chapter 4, but I, want, I do want to talk about the symbology there. So you have a bowl that's sitting there, and it is above the lampstand. That's a seven-branch candlestick uh, that uh, we used to have a, a table up here, and I always had a menorah up on the table so I could use it as an illustration. But it's a seven-branch candlestick, and there's little pipes that come from this bowl down to the seven bowls that are on top of the, of the seven-branched candlestick. And again, you're, you're talking about oil lamps. And so that's, that's what the oil lamp was, the uh, menorah was. And then two trees on either side, and there are pipes coming from the two trees, the two olive trees that are going to the bowl. It's the idea of a continual flow of the Holy Spirit, continual flow of the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, um, oil um, represents the power of the Holy Spirit, and their ministry, these guys, uh, in Revelation chapter 11, are connected with that, and it's the, uh, it's the idea of the Spirit is upon these guys in, uh, in a continual way. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands um, standing before the God of the earth. And so lampstands being the light of the world, uh, Jesus said that we're the light of the world with these guys, you know, mega light. <laughs> these guys are like those, those flashlights that they, that they used on X-Files. You guys remember X-Files? Every time they got into a dark place, they had these awesome flashlights, man. I always wanted one of those. I want a flashlight that just lights up everything. So I, I live on four acres, and sometimes there's animals and, uh, back in my pasture. And, and you know, uh, I've got a police flashlight, and so that's pretty good. But the ones that they had on X-Files, they were just awesome. And so I've never had one that was that good. But you get a good flashlight, and you can, you can look out an acre and a half out, that, that kind of thing. And, and so when I think of the two witnesses, you know, here I am, and I'm, I'm a little candle burning for Jesus. And these guys are just, you know, like mega, you know, mega light, one of, one of the lights that they use for um, theater and that kind of thing. And, and so these are the two lampstands. It talks about their death, and it talks about their life. It goes, on, it goes on in verse 7. It says, when they finish their testimony. Oh, yeah, you know what? Yeah, you can't put their death in there. There it is. So when they finish their testimony, their testimony lasted 1,260 days. Should have been reading my Bible. When they finish it, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem, right? And so uh, when they die, their ministry is going to take place in the land of Israel, and when they die, it's going to be in the streets of Jerusalem, which is kind of wild to think about, having been there a few times, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days. And not, uh, and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. So everyone sees the death of these guys. And so you're going to have all the news anchors are going to be talking 
about the death of the two prophets who had been tormenting all of the world. And so I don't even know who the news anchors are anymore. It used to be like Sam Donaldson and Dan Rather and those, those kind of guys. And all the people since them have been just like, they, get, they just keep mixing them up. <laughs> you know? one, one person does some off-the-wall thing, and so they get rid of her, and then they get, get a new guy, and he does some off-the-wall thing, and they get whoever it's going to be, you know, whoever it is, right before this happens, is gonna be, they're going to be talking about these guys. How is everybody on the planet going to see their dead bodies for three and a half days? How is that going to happen? Can that even happen? When I was a kid, the answer to that was no. It wasn't until um, like the mid-60s, um, I, I believe it was right, right around 1967, this is weird to think about, that we had a satellite that they could bounce a transmission off of so that you could get real-time reporting from other places. So for a major portion of the Vietnam War, they're sending tapes back, videotape, back from Vietnam to play on, on, uh, the, on the news shows in the United States. It was no different than it was in World War II, all the way up until you know, the mid to late 60s. And then all of a sudden they started having uh, video transmission that took place real time. There was always a delay too. Uh, because of, of uh, the way that the whole thing worked. And so at that point, you can, get, um, you can start getting worldwide coverage of an event that's, that's taking place in real time or close to real time. The problem with that was the only coverage that you're going to get where people can all see it is with, with television sets. And so did they have television sets all over the world back in the 60s and 70s? And the answer to that was no. And so there had to be a technology that was going to come along for this to be fulfilled. There had to be a technology that was going to come along that would literally be able to get the, get the, um, the, the video of these guys laying in the, in, the city, in the city streets for three and a half days into every place on the planet. And do we have that technology now? Yeah, it's your cell phone. So you know what, you guys? I've been, I've been to third world countries. Everybody, you know, they, they may not have much food. <laughs> you know, they have, may not have much clothing. You know, it's like a lot of these guys are wearing the same shirt all week long, but they all have a cell phone. It's amazing. And they have plans. They make sure that they, they have a cell phone and they have cell phone plans. They can get Wi-Fi. And, and so it doesn't matter if you're in the middle of if you're in the middle of Africa, out in the boonies in the middle of Africa, the place where I go in Uganda is in the boonies in Uganda. It's a 10-hour ride on a bus over dirt roads from Entebbe. So it's out in the boonies in Uganda. And everybody in the town that I go to, little dink town with dirt roads. They don't have paved roads. But it looks like an old west place with dirt roads. They all have cell phones. Just amazing stuff. And so... Everybody on the world, in the world, those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies uh, three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. It can literally be fulfilled now, and it could not, you know, even up until the 90s. It's like, you know, when I would go through this passage, I'd, I'd go through and go, okay, well, you know, there's, there's possibilities. Maybe they all gather around a TV, you know, the communal TV and the, in the, in, I, I don't know, in the, in, the, in the tribal commune or whatever, maybe they could do that. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking like that. There were possibilities back then, but now it's just ridiculously easy. And so, again, you, you have things that are written in the Bible 2,000 years ago that for the, mo the major portion of the 2,000 years that we've been looking at could not take place. It could not take place, and now it can. And, again, that's, that's amazing stuff. And so it says, they don't allow their dead bodies to be put into the graves, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Okay, so now, now you, you got a situation where, um, you know, they're, they're making merry over the fact that these guys have died, sending gifts to one another. And so put yourself in the, in the situation where you're, 
thinking about how life is going during the tribulation period. We already have people who have major problems with Christmas. Did you hear about the, the uh, mayor over in uh, West Virginia? And again, there's, you know, there's just an attack on Christmas, and so they're going to have a Christmas parade, and it's something that they've done for, you know, for decades and decades and decades. They're going to have a Christmas parade, and she decided that she was going to change the name of the parade from the Christmas parade to the Winter Parade. And so everybody in her West Virginia town, I don't even know how this lady got elected, everybody in her West Virginia town has a, has a total fit about the fact that you're changing it from Christmas to winter, including any Muslims in the West Virginia town, any Jews in the West Virginia, they're all mad at her. And so she ends up changing it back and going, well, I just did it you know, to try to be more inclusive. No, you did it to try to be exclusive. The reason you did it is because you don't like anything that mentions Jesus, anything that points to Jesus. That's the reason you did it. And so the world is going that direction. And we can, you know, it goes back and forth and back and forth. We, you know, we've had all the, all the Christmas wars, you know, the cultural war on Christmas. They're not going to stop. And so if it's during the time of the tribulation period, you think these guys are going to be celebrating Christmas, the coming of the Messiah, Jesus come to earth to save the world? You think the Antichrist is going to be into that? You know, and so probably not. And so Christmas is out the door. And so they need to replace it with Dead Prophets Day. <laughs> and so I think I'm goofing around, but, you know, they got to replace it with something. So let's replace it with Dead Prophets Day. And so we're so glad that these guys are dead, that we're going to have celebrations. We're going to make merry Yuletide cheer, you know, that kind of thing. And we're going to pass out gifts. And here, here, honey, here's your Dead Prophets Day gift. <laughs> you know, oh, thank you, Mommy. You know, <laughs> kind of just cracks me up. In any case, they're pretty, they're pretty um, glad that he's dead. And again, he's, they're killed by the Antichrist. And so, again, you have that whole thing. Um, when you get to the end of the passage here, it says, verse 12, uh, verse 11, and at, now after three, day, three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And so, again, dead prophets day, we have our phones, Facebook, you know, uh, Instagram, all that's like YouTube videos. We have our phones, and people are watching it live, and all of a sudden, these guys stand up. After three and a half days, the breath of life from God enters them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. And so you have them just stand up, and off they go. Come up here, and they go off into a cloud. What's the cloud? Whenever you see the cloud... You know, a lot of times it's talking about the glory of God. So this may be talking about literally the glory of God. It could just be a literal cloud too. But the glory of God that um, hovered over the tabernacle in the Old Testament, the glory of God that filled the temple uh, was always called the Shekinah. You have the glory of God surrounding the shepherds at the birth of Jesus. You have a cloud that surrounds Moses and Elijah and Jesus and John and Peter and uh, James on the mountain. Out of the cloud comes a voice saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. When Jesus ascends up into heaven, he disappears into a cloud. He says when he's coming back, he's coming back with the clouds of glory. And so Jewish speak, that's always the Shekinah. That's always the presence of God. And so it looks like they, uh, they may be uh, disappearing into the Shekinah, into the glory of God. And then it says, in the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell um, in the earthquake. 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. So you have an earthquake, and 7,000 people die. You know, there's a passage in 1 Kings where 7,000 had not bowed the knee to Baal. It's kind of an opposite thing. You have a situation where you have all these people dancing around uh, the bodies of the prophets, and so 7,000 of them get taken out. So that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. And then he says, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. 
and then you have the seventh trumpet. You remember that um, in the book of Revelation, you, you have the, the different uh, judgments divided up into um, six judgment passages, so six, six seals, and then there's a parenthesis where there are good things taking place instead of all just judgment, and then you have the seventh seal, so six judgments, parenthesis with good things happening, then the seventh judgment, the seventh, the seventh seal. Well, it's the same thing in the trumpet judgments. Six of the trumpet judgments take place, and then we have a parenthesis, which is chapter 10 and chapter 11. And uh, the, the, in chapter 10, we have the promise that what's going to happen is the Lord's going to come, and he's taking control of the earth. That's what chapter 10 is all about. Chapter 11, we have two guys who are stand-up men who will oppose the Antichrist, and they don't care um, what he does to them. They're used by God. They're filled with the Holy Spirit, um, men who won't compromise. And then finally they're killed, but it doesn't end there. They're raised, and they're taken up into glory. And that's all good stuff that's taken place. And then you have the seventh trumpet, and that wraps up the trumpet judgments. It says, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you've taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. And so when you look at the seventh trumpet, you, you have this uh, revelation that the kingdoms, first off, the kingdoms are Jesus's. And again, you see that um, down in verse 15. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So the kingdoms are Jesus's. Do you remember the, the temptation of Christ? Remember what Satan offered him? He said, I know you're hungry, first off. He said, I know you're hungry. If you're the son of God, and actually in Greek it can be translated, since you're the son of God, why don't you turn this bread, this, this, these stones into bread and eat it? And Jesus said, man shall not eat by bread or live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so shut up is what he's saying to, to Satan. Not going to happen. And then the next thing that Satan did was he takes him up to a high mountain and he shows him all the kingdoms of the earth. I'm, I'm getting this one out of Luke. There's different orders. Um, depending on the, on the, on the gospel, uh, takes him up to a high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the earth in a moment of time. And he says, these are all mine and I can give them to whomever I please. And if you'll bow down and worship me, I will give them to you. And what Satan was saying at that point was, I know why you're here. I know what you're doing. I know that you're coming to get, to, to get the kingdoms of the earth. And Satan had control. Satan still has a control of the kingdoms of the earth. And basically what Satan was doing was saying to Jesus, we can do a shortcut. And you have, to, you have to understand this from Satan's point of view. He understands that Jesus is God come down to the earth, but now what he's got is God come down to the earth in the form of a human. And humans are made a little bit lower than the angels. In fact, the Bible says that specifically about Jesus, that he was made a little bit lower than the angels to suffer. And so you've got this situation where Satan has always been the antagonist of God. He's always known that he's nothing but a created being and God is the, is, is the ultimate creator. And he know, knew it for sure when he was cast out of heaven. And so when Satan does his rebellion, he thinks, we're gonna talk about this in the next chapter, he thinks that he gets a third of the angels on his side and he's got enough to take out God and make himself the ruler in his place which lets you know that he doesn't really understand who he's dealing with. And so when that happens, God doesn't have to do much of anything. He just says, you're out. And Satan falls to the earth. 
And you have Jesus talking about that whole thing. And so um, Satan knows that he, is, he does not have power to overcome God. And so what he does is he shifts his attack. And so what he goes after for, from that period of time on um, is the thing, or actually are the people that God loves the most. And so you see him going into an attack with uh, Adam and Eve, and in that attack, he kills the whole human race for all of the rest of time. He's a murderer from the beginning. And what he did was he took the whole human race and he took them out of the life that God had for them. Life that was eternal was the promise. He took them out of that and he killed them. And God said to them that on the day that you eat of that tr from the fruit of that tree, dying, you will die. The whole death process comes in at that point. And that's exactly what happened. And so we're all in that situation. Dying, we're going to die. So from, from the time that I'm a kid, the potential that I have is to grow up and my body's doing all kinds of stuff to make me new and better and all those kinds of things up until the time that I'm a teenager. And at the time that I, at the end of my teenage years, what happens is everything starts falling apart. Everything starts getting old. Everything starts wearing down. And dying, I'm gonna die. So even though I have a potential of life that gets cut off and we all end up in the same place. We're all going to the same place. We're all going to die unless the Lord comes back. And so Satan killed us at that point. He killed the human race. And from that point on, what Satan does is he begins attacking the human race in more and more specific attacks as he finds out where Messiah is coming from. And so first, it's just generally, well, actually, he overhears what God says to Eve in the garden and he taught, uh, God had said to Eve, that, or actually had said to him, that there is a child coming from the woman, the woman's seed, seed of the woman, is gonna crush your head, and you're gonna bruise his heel. Um, that's literally what it says in Hebrew. Um, and so the very next attack that you see is between two of the woman's sons, Cain and Abel. So Satan is taking God literally, and he's like, okay, seed of the woman, that's the woman that we're talking about. And so she's got a couple of sons here, Cain and Abel, so I'm going to make one a murderer, and I'm going to make the other one dead. And so you see an attack there. And then what happens is uh, Eve has another son. Actually, she has multiple sons after that. And so, you know, what are we going to do? Kill off every son of Eve? And, and obviously, God's not going to allow that. And so then what he does is he goes after the human race as a whole. And he tries to per pervert and overcome the human race, and that leads to the flood. And so he wipes out the whole human race. And obviously God's involved in that because it's the judgment of God. But he puts the human race in a position where God has no choice but judgment except for eight people. And so now we've taken the billions that it would, would have come in that 1,600 years. We've wiped them all out. We brought it down to eight people. And then you see attacks on those eight people. And um, you have the attack on Noah right after the flood. And then you find out that, it's, that the line of Jesus is going to come from Shem. And you uh, find out that it's going to come from Abraham. You have attacks on Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And as it gets more and more specific, when it gets to the, to the point where that we know that, that the Messiah is coming from the kingly line of Judah, you see specific attacks on the, on the kingdom of Judah, on the kings of Judah. When he finds out it's from the line of David, there are specific attacks on David and his line having to do with his family. And it goes like, goes like that until the coming of Jesus. And so all up until that point, all that Satan's got to do, all he can do to get at God is go after the ones that God loves the most, which is us. And then God decides to put on human form and come down and make himself vulnerable at that point. And so that's what Satan's doing with Jesus. The guy who was everywhere at the same time, omnipresent. The guy who was all powerful, omnipotent. The guy who was all seeing, omniscient, has now come down and he's limited himself and he's made himself a human being. And now I can get him. And so he goes up to him, and he's uh, appealing to Jesus' human will. And he says, you know what? Basically what he's saying is, we don't have to do the cross. You don't have to die. 
You don't have to do, you don't have to do any of that. You don't have to suffer. We don't even have to prolong this. You don't have to be here any longer. Uh, you know, this is the beginning of your ministry. We can, we can just stop it right here. If you'll just bow down to me, if you'll just bow down, I'll quit. I'll give it up. I'll give you it all. And Jesus says, no, that's not going to happen. And again, you, you have that whole situation. What Jesus did was he came to buy back the kingdoms of the world. He came to redeem us. So he redeems us, specifically us. And then he, he buys back not only us, but he buys back our land too. He buys back the earth. And so G Satan knew that Jesus was coming to get the earth. And when Jesus dies on the cross, that was payment, not only for our salvation, but for the salvation of the planet. And so the planet becomes the Lord's. And ultimately, you know, I understand that in the Bible it talks about the, the earth is, is the Lord's and all the fullness thereof. But what God's done is he's backed off because of the, the choices that everyone's making. And so the people of the earth decided against God and they decided for Satan. That is what happened in the garden. And people since that point are still continually doing these things. We're, we're still either choosing for God or for the enemy of God. And it doesn't matter how, how you want to phrase that, how you want to how, how fog that whole thing up. If I am not doing the will of God, whose will am I doing? Well, my own. No. There's somebody who's influencing you. It's going one way or another. And so God, God in this area is speaking in black and white. You're either for me or you're against me. You either gather with me or you scatter. You're, you're either for the enemy or you're for me. So which one is it? And so we've been making those choices ever since that point. But Jesus comes and he pays for not only me and not only you, but for the kingdoms of the earth too, everything. He came and he bought everything. And what's going to happen is he's going to come back and get everything. So basically what we, what we have is a situation where the, where the payment was made for everything that Jesus uh, came to buy. And there's coming a, a time when he's going to come and he's going to collect. So... He paid for you. So guess what he's going to do? He's going to collect. He's going to come and get you. And ultimately, that's, that's all of the church. But that's what the rapture of the church is about. You realize that in the rapture of the church, everybody goes. Everybody goes. And so there are people, and you, and you go, well, you know, aren't there people already in heaven? Yes. But the Bible says that when Jesus comes back, that he brings with him those who have died. So yeah, they're in heaven, but he's bringing them with him, and then they're the ones who are raised first. So if you have a family member that died, and you know, my grandma wanted, to, wanted Jesus to come back in her time, and she was looking forward to Jesus coming back and making her new, just like I am, and uh, she was excited about that whole thing, and then she dies. And after that happened, I was like, oh, that's just a bummer. Grandma died. You know, she's in heaven. That's great. But grandma died, and, and you know, I always thought that that's a bummer that she missed the rapture. Then I go back and read 1 Thessalonians 4, and I realize, oh, no, she didn't. She's going to be first. <laughs> and so the Lord comes back and reunites her with her body, and her body is raised from the dead, and she's going to, she's going to precede the rest of us. And then the rest of us are in our physical bodies, and the Bible says that we're translated and we're taken up into heaven with the Lord. And that's the rapture. Jesus comes back and gets everyone. It's going to be the same thing at the end of the tribulation. The people who die during the tribulation are going to be raised from the dead. We get into that in Revelation 20. The people who live through the tribulation, Jesus gets them also. They're not raised from the dead. They're, you know, they're just physically alive at that point, but they're his. He comes back and gets everyone that's his. And everyone that aren't his, they're, they're evicted. There's an eviction notice. And so when you're going through the book of Revelation, this is escrow, basically. There's a period of time where the payment's been made, there's a period of time where the old owner is still there and they have to vacate the premises. And that's what's happening during the, uh, the book of Revelation, during the tribulation period. These people are vacating the premises. Um, the kings are, kingdoms are angry and your wrath has come. The time of the judgment of the dead has come. Uh, the time of reward for the righteous has come. The time to destroy the destroyers has come. Um, and again, 
when you're looking at these judgments, they're similar to all the ends of the judgments. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more next week, and then we'll get into chapter 12. But again, in, in any case, you have, a, you have a situation here where God's proclaiming the fact that we're at the end here, and we're all done. And uh, the kingdoms of the earth are going to become the kingdoms of the Christ. And so that's a cool thing. So when I, uh, stuff to take away from this, and I've already mentioned it, I, I like these guys. Um, we don't have, you know, like a full biography of both of these guys. And like I said, could be Moses and Elijah, and I kind of think that, that it is. So we have a biography of them during their lifetime. But what you have here is people who are standing up in the worst time in human history. They don't care what people have to say about them. You guys, um, have you guys thought about MAGA hats? Make America great again? You know what happens to people who wear MAGA hats? Yeah. So we see this on, uh, in news media all the time. And so these are usually in other places. And, you know, just to, just to let you know, I'm, uh, let me give you my politics on this whole thing. I didn't vote for, for Donald Trump, but I really like him now. You know why? Because everybody's so stinking mean to the guy. Just makes me mad. And actually, he's been keeping promises. I like that, too. But the whole thing with MAGA hats, wearing a MAGA hat get, makes you a target, right? And people hate you, right? And so you, you have that. Half the, half the country hates you if you're wearing a MAGA hat. And that's the kind, you know, it's, it, it's like that's a, that's a little bit of the vitriol that's coming against Christians. We're going to be hated. The Jews are going to be hated. You're going to want to keep your head down. And so um, when I was in Washington, D.C., one of my secretaries wanted a MAGA hat. And so there was some, some guys on, you know, along the road um, who were selling them. And so uh, actually they asked me if I wanted to buy one. I guess I must look like a Trump supporter or something. And so I'm walking down the road, and they go, hey, you want a MAGA hat? And I, I go over and I go, actually, yes, I do. I, I need to get it for, you know, for a gift for somebody. And so I go over and buy it. And as I'm buying it, you know, I, I didn't get it for myself, and so I didn't put it on my head. But I, I, I thought about it as I, as I bought this thing, and I said, I wonder what would happen to me if I just took one of these, stuck it on my head, and walked around this city. What would happen to me? And, you know, it, it makes you want to duck. It, it makes you, makes you want to hide uh, and, and, and that kind of thing. And again, that's a, that's a political thing, but just take that and transfer that over into the Christian thing. You're going to have that kind of hatred, actually even worse than that, for Christians. And you got two guys who do not care, who stand up no matter what, and they oppose the evil. They open their mouths. They won't shut up. And God blesses them, fills them with the Spirit, makes them the last two prophets before the coming of Christ, just make, gives them an awesome ministry. And when we get into chapter 12, it's going to talk about the fact that not only do those guys do that, we have a whole group of people during the tribulation period who do not care. They don't care what, what the world thinks. They don't care what the world says. They don't, think, they don't care that people are going to kill them. They don't care. They're just going to stand up and do what's right. I think we can take a lot from that, Right? You know, there are times when, you know, I've told you about the eight-year-old on the plane. I'm on a plane this one time going, and I witnessed to people on planes, and I'm sitting next to an eight-year-old, and I'm, like, I'm wondering how I'm going to share Jesus with him, and I'm sweating, and my heart's pumping. And he's an eight-year-old, <laughs> and I'm afraid of an eight-year-old. Uh, you know, wondering how I'm going to do this stuff. And I ended up witnessing to him, and, and he ended up being a Christian, and he, he already was. And so it was a cool conversation. But it just cracked me up that I was afraid of an eight-year-old. And um, here I am. I'm huge. And I'm, you know, I was rowdy. Not, I, I don't get afraid of anything, you know. I was talking to my wife the other day about fear, and I was like, there's not a lot of fear. I don't, ha I don't have a lot of fear in situations. And it's, it's because of where I came from. You know, I fear losing family members. That's what I fear. And... Um, uh, you know, fear disappointing the Lord, but it's not like a, I'm afraid kind of thing. I'm an afraid type of person. I don't have those things until I'm witnessing. And all of a sudden, I'm afraid of eight-year-olds. These, these guys are not, and it's because they're filled with the Spirit. We need to have the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, and we need to not be afraid no matter what. 
And so you can wear the Christian MAGA hat. <laughs> you know, put it on your head, make yourself a target, let everybody know where you stand, and just go, I follow Jesus. And uh, have, that, have that kind of heart, that kind of attitude. So let me pray and get you out of here. Thanks, Jesus, again for your word. Thank you for the time uh, that um, we get to spend in it. God, I thank you for these people and for hearts that w just want to hear from you. Lord, I, I thank you for the cool prophecies that we have in passages like this. I, uh, it's, it's just cool to live in, in the times that are the precursors to these times because over and over we see events that are taking place that couldn't have happened even 100 years ago. And here we are seeing uh, some of the opportunities for the fulfillment of these things. We have cell phones, and, and I, I imagine by the time that this stuff happens, the technology is going to be even more radical. Uh, Elon Musk is going to be putting up satellites, and you're going to have, we're going to have Wi-Fi all over the world um, is what, what he's planning on. And so, Lord, we're just living in awesome times. God, we pray that you would help us to be strong in you, help us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, help us to be people who are unashamed, um, Lord, we want to put a hat on our heads uh, that say it's all about Jesus and, and be people who follow after you. And so, God, bless these guys. Be with them. Fill them. Make them like you. Make them bold. And we ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you. Have a good, good night. Good week, too.